not only were watching the colors fascinating to me, but what was especially interesting was the after image of one color onto the next. Um, this is something that I don't think we think about very often, but I think about it a lot with my photos. This is a story about Mrs. Rowe, uh, Mrs. Cheryl Rowe. I wonder if she'll, she'll watch this. I haven't talked to her in forever, but she was my English teacher at high school. Um, I went to Jesuit high school in Dallas, Jesuit college prep, all boy Catholic school. And you know, for whatever reason, you end up just remembering certain teachers. And she said something, I don't know if she said it in an offhand way or how she said it, but uh, she said something that really affected my life and kind of changed it forever. And, you know, it's so nice when you have a, a gentle teacher that you respect say something gentle to you and it kind of sinks in, kind of unexpected. And so this is what happened. I, um, I loved writing. I really did. I didn't know if I was good at it, but it was sort of a creative thing that I enjoyed doing. And I wrote a story, um, a short story, sort of a novelette, with a, a friend. We co-wrote it. His name was Michael Gillette. Uh, wonderful guy. Um, he, was, uh, he was always a bit effete. Um, he was British, and I was, I was an Anglophile because I, I grew up uh, watching a lot of PBS. I would watch all the, the BBC programs, everything from Monty Python to uh, Keeping Up Appearances, uh, Blackadder, you name it. So I just kind of just had this real affection for anything that came out of England. And so I, that may be why I like this guy. And he also liked to write. And so we took on this writing project together, and we wrote a, a Sherlock Holmes story. Um, it was pretty long, actually. It turned out pretty long. I would write a bunch of pages, and he would write a bunch of pages, and we'd check each other. It was really fun. And uh, we ended up getting it published in Ellery Queen magazine, which is one of these uh, British magazines where they, they write about mysteries and uh, true crime and this sort of stuff, I guess. Um, but it was like one of many projects we did in Mrs. Rowe's class. And, you know, we didn't feel like special students or anything, but we certainly enjoyed it which I guess looking back was a fairly unique thing in high school to have like people actually enjoy an English class. Um, but I remember at, at the end, she came to me and she had these big blue eyes. Um, I'll never forget it. And, and she said, Trey, I'm, I'm really gonna miss having you in my class. You had a really unique, unique way of saying things, a unique way of writing. And I thought, wow, what a, what a nice thing to say, because I, I didn't feel like that. But she, she actually made me feel like that. I feel like she actually singled me out and said that. And so this kind of inspired me to keep writing. And after I left college and I, I joined this uh, consulting company called Anderson Consulting, you know, I'd be busy during the day. I was coding, you know, sort of an IT monkey kind of guy, I guess. <laughs> and um, I would, at night, I would go off to coffee shops and I started writing a novel. And I ended up writing a, a whole novel. And I was really excited about it. Um, it was like my creative thing. And I, I sent it off to, you know, 20 publishers you know, in New York. I didn't really even know how to do it, but I would actually print out the whole book. I went to Kinko's. I, I spent so much money back then, you know, it's a lot of money when you don't have much to print out all this stuff and to mail it around and basically got rejected by absolutely everybody. It was really kind of sad and depressing. Um, and this is really kind of, you know, before internet publishing or any of this kind of stuff, it was the only way to go. You had to go through these gatekeepers of, of media. Thank God there's no more gatekeepers of media, by the way. Um, so the novel failed and turned out like maybe that wasn't what I was supposed to do with my life. Um, and it was kind of made me a little sad and depressed. And I was kind of like, well, you know, I don't know what to do creatively anymore. But it turned out that by the time I uh, you know, hit 35 or 36 and over a decade later, I started this blog. And the writing came really, really easy to me because I had spent so much time doing it in the past. And what this has kind of proved to me, kind of the lesson I got out of this is that sometimes you kind of stumble through life and you try a lot of things and they fail. 
try not to be too hard on yourself, but you get a little disappointed anyway. Um, but sometimes in life, as you stumble through it, you're accidentally preparing for some kind of greatness that will come to you at another time. So with this blog, it was so easy for me to write. You know, it's not great writing all the time. It's not always elegant writing, but sometimes maybe it's okay. But the writing came so easily for me, all because of this little thing that, that Mrs. Rowe said. And I think that there's another artistic overlap lesson that I learned from it. And it's this idea about um, composition. I think I first came to know composition through literature. You know, when you read something that's very elegantly written with the right words, and there's a, a free kind of poetry to it, it just seems beautiful. And then, you know, I try to write stuff like this sometimes, and I rearrange words, and I, I try to make it look nice and feel nice, and sometimes I get the right composition. But it occurs to me it's not that different than photography. Like here we are in these, uh, these amazing trees, and they're almost like words that are waiting to be, they're waiting to be composed with each other. And I kind of get to compose it how I want to or how I think it might be interesting. So this is a lesson that I, I try to carry forward as I, as I do this kind of stuff because in a way, you know, an elegant piece of prose that's beautiful is not that different than an elegant photo that's beautiful. So I do my humble best to, to do this. Well, as long as we're here, um, I'll talk practically about the kind of shot that I'm going to get. These, these trees are unbelievable, and I've never seen any trees like them in my life. Uh, they're so exciting. Each one is so different, so individual, and I guess they are kind of like words in that way, that they're so different. A lot of times I go to forest and the trees are maybe just a little bit different, but these are dramatically different. It's like a thesaurus that's coming out of the ground. And I'm moving around the trees and trying to get as many interesting angles as I can. I try to predict what it's going to look like from the other side. We have a setting sun over here, so I might try to put the sun on one side and the tree on the other. Maybe I want to go, you know, landscape. Maybe I want to go portrait. Uh, but you kind of guess, and you try a lot of things, and you fall down sometimes. And I basically try to get a wide cornucopia of shots, and then I go into Lightroom later, and I kind of pick the best ones. And this very simple idea that you can, uh, a lot of different shots, and you choose the best of the best, this cycle will help you get better at composition over time. Um, everyone knows what is beautiful. Just like if you're not a writer and you read something beautiful, you think this is a, this is a beautiful thing I've just read. And if you're a photographer and you're just getting started, when you take a beautiful photo that's well composed, you just know it. So you know inside. But you've got to get out and shoot. You've got to try a lot of different shots. And that's what I'm going to do here. I can't stop doing it. I'm absolutely addicted to composing it different ways. I'll never get tired of it. And it's just a it's like a, a dream come true that all this is that all this has happened. So anyway, there's some some thoughts for you. So I'll I'll run around here and take some photos and see if um, see if I can make something beautiful and elegant. Let's go through some of these tree shots and I'll give you a few different interpretations of them. And then at the end, what we'll do is I'll show you a really cool way to process photos. All right might be something new to you. So here we just have a bunch of different tree photos. Um, you know, the shapes are so nice, aren't they? And I just did a lot of different filters, just experimented, tried composing them in different ways, different orientations, uh, many different types of effects I tried to put on these just to, just to play with them and have a good time, just have a sort of a playful spirit with these trees. And you know, a lot of these I'll probably never publish. They're just little ideas, um, little studies, little thoughts. Uh, just for experimentation. I do quite like this one. This one's one of my favorites, even though it's kind of the most plain. There's something about those uh, things on the bottom, those, uh, those bush things and the smoothness of the tree. I just really like it. So now I want to show you something called um, HDR, or High Dynamic Range Photography. And maybe you've heard me talk about this before. And this is a really fun way to take and process photos. Basically what happens with an HDR photo, you can tell this has a certain look, can't you? Well, what happens with an HDR photo is you can bring out all the light that's really there and you can make the final photo feel like it actually did, all right? The idea behind it is that the human retina can see a lot more light than a camera sensor. So you can kind of trick the camera 
And in the post-processing, you can bring out all the light that's really there, okay? Sometimes this involves taking multiple photos, a dark, a medium, and a bright one. And that's what I'm gonna do here in this example, all right? You can also take an HDR um, with just a single photo, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well, okay? So here's some samples of some HDR photos. You can see how they just look and feel different um, than most other kinds of photos. Um, I love this uh, method so much. Uh, that's in Tokyo, this is in China. Uh, this is in Hobbiton, from the Hobbiton movie set. You kind of get this just dreamy painterly effect that I absolutely love. Um, this is near Pattaya in Thailand. There's China. This is here in Queenstown. This is my home in the fall. Uh, by the way, you guys are welcome to come out to one of our photo adventures out here sometime. Uh, just sign up for our newsletter over at Stuck in Customs and you can find out more. Go on a little photo adventure with me. So this is one that we're going to work on today together. All right, let's see what we can do. Okay, let's switch over here to, um, where are we going? Okay, we're going here to Lightroom. Okay, so here are our three shots, okay? One, two, three. We have uh, bright, uh, medium, and dark, okay? And if you see there's a lot of junk on the, on the sensor here, that's because I shot this at a very high f-stop, okay? And when you shoot stuff at a high f-stop, like here f-19, you get to see all the stuff that's on your lens and sensor. The reason I went to f-19 is so that we get this kind of nice starburst effect, which I quite like, okay? All right, so when you're making an HDR photo, you can take these three shots that, you, that you've previously taken and you can run them through um, a variety of programs. I'm gonna show you one here called um, Photomatics. But be sure to check my website for whatever might be the, uh, the latest um, set of tools that I'm using because it's always, it's always changing. Um, if you just go to the HDR tutorial on the website, there's a free tutorial there that guides you through this. There's also a paid video tutorial that's uh, many hours and kind of shows you this whole process in a much um, slower pace, okay? We're not gonna go super fast today, but we're gonna go kind of fast. Um, okay, so these are the three photos that go in. Then we have some options here, uh, take it on a tripod. No need to reduce noise, but we will reduce the chromatic aberrations. I will say align and merge to HDR. So what's happening now is there's this HDR algorithm that is acting upon these three photos. It's looking at it pixel by pixel by pixel and choosing which pixels to show based on the nearest neighbors. It's doing something that's called tone mapping. And it's related to what I talked about in another episode, the way that colors interact with one another, okay? So here we are inside Photomatics and you can see it's already tremendously different. We've hardly done anything to it. All right, um, over here on the right are my presets. Um, these are called Trays Photomatics presets that I kind of came up with over the years. And you see different ones work with this photo. Some ones just don't work with the photo, okay? Uh, sometimes they work great on other photos though. That one looks really nice, doesn't it? Under the green sea, I love it. And kind of the, the deeper you go down here, the more druggy it starts to look. We'll start with this one, Under the Green Sea. And then we can, of course, play with the sliders and move them around, play with the tonal range compression. It's really fun to play with this thing. Look at that. That looks nicer when it's up, doesn't it? Uh, the white clip, black clip. Yeah, I like this. Um, color saturation. I like to have a little bit of darkness in my HDR photos. I think having some darkness helps give other colors a, their vibration. Yeah, I think this is looking really nice, don't you? Cool. Okay, so now I will say apply, all right? And then we'll have a, a version of the photo, okay? Now, we can just be done right now if we wanted to. I could always pick medium sharpening there. We can be done right now, it looks fine, right? Maybe we'll do a few more tweaks just to, to make it look even better, okay? But that's one of the funnest things about these HDR programs is this is what happened. Uh, let me just show you the original, that's right, right here. Okay, so we, we started with that, and then already we have that. Look at that. You know, you kind of put them, try to put them side by side here so you can kind of see the difference. And look how much difference. Look at all the, the detail that we're getting out of this, this Photomatics one. I mean, HDR is so fun. Look at that. It's just, it's unbelievable. And you saw it only took me, you know, 30 seconds. Boom shakalaka. Oh, yeah. 
Okay, so let's save this. Actually, I'll close it and then it saves it into my little processing directory right there. Save. Good. Okay, good. Now let's go here into um, Lightroom and let's make a really pretty version of this. Okay, let's go into the develop module and let's just jam one of my presets on here. We'll just do um, um, clean Sunday because I think this always has sort of a nice look up in the sky. I like, I like that, that tone of blue. It's a little overexposed, isn't it? So let's just bring it down a little bit. There we go, good, okay. Now I'm going to uh, right click and I'm going to export this um, as an idea. Now, the idea here that we're going for is we're going to have two different versions of this photo and we're going, to com we're going to combine them into one, okay? So if you go down here to Adobe Bridge, um, and let's go here to Processing, and here's our two photos. You can see they're quite different, okay? One and two. We're going to bring them both into Photoshop. So we have Tools, Photoshop, Load Files, and Photoshop Layers go coming on in so they're gonna pile up right on top of each other the first thing I do after they come in is I choose which of them I like more and I put it on top okay so I like the HDR version better okay so I'm going to go ahead and align them because they get a little bit misaligned because of the HDR process so I'm gonna shift click both of them I'll say edit auto align layers auto there we go, that'll line them up lickety split, just like that. Let's start with a bit of cropping. Okay, let's crop in, let's make it a bit more cinematic here, okay. Cut off a little of the top and the bottom. You know, we just have too much sky. This is something that um, I always advise photographers not to do is, you know, if you do have kind of a nice cloud or something, you don't have to keep showing all of it. You can, you can just have the hint of it and the, the viewer will imagine it just continuing on. So I think my horizon might be a little off here, so let's just straighten that up a little bit like that. Yes, yeah, so that looks good. Enter. Good. And compositionally, you can probably see what I was going for here in that we have a strong element on the right in the sun and a strong element on the left in the tree. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and make a layer mask. and I'll pick a brush about 50%, and then I'll start brushing through to the layer beneath. Okay, I have this hotkey that I click all the time to go back and forth to see what's underneath, because I do kind of like the blue tones of that sky a little bit. So we're just going to bring in that sky just a little bit. Okay, what else do we like? I like a little bit of the vignetting down here, over right here, just like this, just brushing a little bit, just a little bit. Yeah, it looks nice. Let's light up that tree there. Good. So now when I hit this key, this is the backslash key, you can see where I brushed and where I didn't. Or if I hide this, you can see uh, where I painted through to mix the two layers together. All right, awesome. That looks really good. Really, really good. Now let's get rid of some of these little spots, uh, like this one, like that one, like that one. Good, okay. These are not spots, they're just bushes, but they're a little too contrasty, so it's trying to get rid of them. Okay, now let's do this trick where we um, uh, make things a little glowy glowy. All right, so we're gonna do a double dupe, dupe dupe. We're gonna take this layer and we're going to blur it. All right, we're gonna go um, filter, blur, Gaussian blur, blur it up like this, okay. We're going to change it to overlay. All right, the overlay blend mode, like this. It's a bit dark, isn't it? So let's brighten it up. This is a bit of an advanced maneuver, um, but we can click on curves here. All right, you get this uh, crazy looking thing. We gotta click this little er, that means that whatever adjustments we make will only do it to the layer right beneath it. And then I'm gonna drag this up to kind of brighten it, okay? Now, let's take the normal version, so-called normal version. This is why we duped it twice, by the way, and move it up here to the top, okay? Now, wherever we paint through, I'll make a layer mask here, wherever we paint through, it'll sort of have that glow. So if we look down here at the rocks, we're only going to do this in a few places. This is rocks without the glow, that's rocks with full glow. I kind of like the glowy rocks, don't you? So what I'm doing now, as I go back and forth, is I'm just kind of scanning around the photo, looking for parts that I like and parts that I don't like. Okay. So we're definitely going to do these rocks down here. OK. 
Okay, make them all glowy, glowy. Very nice. Same over here. It's kind of vignetting a little bit too on the edges, which I do like. Maybe a bit of glow up here in the tree. Maybe a little bit more here around the sun. A few pops there. Good. Yeah, I like the way this looks. Right on. Let's drop that down a little bit, and we'll kind of exact. We'll go along these streaks too. Right. Right on. Very cool. So you can kind of see where I painted through here to get the glow. Everywhere you see this stuff, I got more glowy. Okay. Whoop. There we go. Awesome. Okay, let's look at a before and after. It's that one. And then let's go over here to uh, our Lightroom. Let's uh, reset it. F here. Okay, so this was our shot um, straight out of the camera. And after we have HDR'd it and combined it with uh, an element of itself from Lightroom, we ended up with this. All right, awesome. Okay, well, thank you for joining me on this episode. I hope this kind of got you a little interested in HDR. If you see how fun and easy it is. Um, it's something that absolutely anybody can do. I really encourage it. And may you go find your own fortune and play with it yourself. All right, thanks, and I will see you in the next episode. I think there's something maybe a bit backwards in the way that some people learn photography in that there's an overemphasis on the tech side of it. And really, I'm here to tell you that you don't actually have to know to use your camera. Uh, you don't have to know everything about your camera in order to take an interesting picture.